Welcome to SNC. If you want to come into the church, we're going to start by praising God together.
joyful 
hello everybody and welcome to church tonight. My name is Sarah, for those of you who do not yet know me, and it's lovely to have you. I want to give a special warm welcome to anyone who's new and hello to everyone who's online as well. Um, this week, the staff team and um, we all went away for like a planning and praying staff retreat. Now, I'm like... I'm on trim, so like a student minister, and I had the privilege of going and seeing the absolute beauty but chaos of the staff retreat, and I want to tell you all about it, but I want to tell you in a fun way, so I've got a game in mind. I'm going to say, we're all going to stand up, I'm going to say a couple of things that we did at the staff retreat, and if you think that it's true, stay standing, and if you think that it's false, you guys can sit down. So everyone jump up. (laughs) <laughs> no, 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 I've got some good ones. It's like the staff team unmasked. All right, all right. On the staff team, on the staff retreat, we saw our very own Punchy acting as seven dancing giraffes with his elbows. True? Stay standing. False, sit down. Seven... Seven, oh, sorry, Punch, you can't tell them. <laughs> Seven dancing giraffes. You know what's terrible is that it was actually five dancing giraffes, but I'm going to say it's true, it's true, it's true. Punchy was dancing with his elbows. Do you want to recreate it for us, Punch? <laughs> um, all right, here's the next one for you. While we were away, we dreamt about a 50-meter swimming pool in the back of the church, the church backyard. True or false? Can you imagine, like a swimming lap pool? That would be so cool. True or false? All right, all right, all right. It is true, it's true, it's true, it's true. We have big dreams, guys, big dreams. Okay, okay, I don't know, stand up everyone. I don't know if you guys know, but um, Stefan has a really nice fancy car, it's called a Jag. And while we were away, our very own Connor planked on the jag, true or false? He planked, like did a plank on the jag. All right, all right, those sitting down are correct. It's not true. But Connor did suggest it multiple times, did you not? A lot of respect. (laughs) Uh, I've got two more for us. We did a lot of planning and praying, did I say that? Okay, good, good, good. (laughs) No, 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 it's true, it's true. Here we go. We have a church directory, which has everyone's like names and address. No, it's, that's a true fact. <laughs> we worked through the church directory, praying for everyone in our church. True or false? <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. They're standing up all right. We did work through it. We prayed for all the people um, in our church. And we spent a lot of time praying and planning for next year. (laughs) Shush, (laughs) Josh. All right, I've got one more. Everyone stand up for those who want to play. It's Jamie Holdens, our very own guitarist. It's his 30th birthday today. True or false? It's true. All right, you can all sit down, all sit down. Um, If you get to see our beautiful guitarist, say happy birthday to him. Um, And also, if you want to talk to the staff team and like hear what we did while we were away, I'm sure Andrew's going to inform you of our dreams and hopes and plans, but um, it was a really special time being away together, getting into God's word. We were reading through Titus and we spent a lot of time praying and reflecting and asking for God's help. So that was one of the highlights of my week. Um, Before we get into too much more, I've got a couple of announcements tonight. Um, The first one is we've got Life Explored, which is our Christianity Explored course that Punch is running. Yeah, Punch is running. Um, You can sign up for that now. So go to the website if you're interested. We also have our Weekend Away. Uh, That is in October. And before we have the Weekend Away, we're having that fundraiser, so the auction. It's actually next weekend. Is that, yeah, the 14th? Yeah, next weekend after church. So if you want to come, also if you want to auction something off, please, um, I think there's a form. So go to the form and write up what you want to auction. Uh, And the last thing is a women's event. 
We're having another women's event. It's our Women's Discipleship Day. It's August 27th. Uh, Saturday, yeah, 11 till 2. It's going to have lunch, so if you want to register for that, you also can go to the website. Yeah, I think that's all the announcements. I'm going to invite Punch Up to interview Carolyn. Yeah, you can clap if you want <laughs> for Carolyn. Yeah, it's my privilege to interview Carolyn. Uh, Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Punchy and this is Carolyn. Hello, and it, Carolyn and this is Punch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, Carolyn is a member of the Justice and Mercy team, a team we haven't heard from for a little while. So we've got Carolyn up here to give us a bit of a refresher, a reminder of all the activities and things that have been going on. Yeah, <clears throat> yes. Um, well, the, the Justice and Mercy team has actually been in existence for over 20 years before I came to this church. But um, it was very hard to try and distill 20 years into one minute of photos. But we're going to try and show you some of the things that we've been doing over that time. So if you just look to the screen, you'll see some old faces and young faces and some things that we did. This was like a ministry team. There's Anne and Sandra and Leonie. And there's the Tear Fund Easter shop. Share the harvest up at Menai. And we cleaned up Australia. <coughs> there's a Justice and Mercy workshop at Camp One. Okay, have a look at that, Lewis, children. <laughs> Our students at the World Vision Lit Conference. The NADOC interview and our ethical clothing display. Breakfast at the boat shed when we had food and fellowship. And there's Sarah interviewing two young girls who were forced to flee because of refugee issues. A few little teddies. Food for Berkeley Life Center from our youth. And there is our famous team. <laughs> so that gives you a little bit of an idea. What the, 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 um, the whole... Um, uh, idea, the aim of that team has always been to serve God and those in need, following Jesus into the world, um, which is the core of our faith. Because if we look at Philippians 2, it talks about Jesus emptying himself and taking on the very nature of a servant. We took that, um, that name, um, Justice and Mercy, from that verse in Micah 6, 8, which said, what does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? Awesome. Great team. Lots of stuff going on over the years. But today, there's a, a, a name change. And so, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So We're do you going wanna... from Old Testament to New Testament yeah. now. That's it. We're bringing it into the... <laughs> yeah, I'll, sorry. I'll, over to you, <laughs> Carolyn. Don't do you give the secrets about, away. About but... the change. What's the plan from here? Okay. The new name is Love Your Neighbour. Um, we thought that was a good one because it had already started to be in, in existence during the pandemic because we needed to, um, or we decided um, to bring in groceries for the people in our community who were doing it tough during that time. There were a lot of um, really um, deep needs and we were able to address those because Mac was very generous in supplying lots of groceries and non-perishable food which we distributed. And then we used the name again this year when we were asked... Um, to um, cooperate with Anglicare in um, collecting uh, sheets and towels and blankets for the flood victims up in the north of New South Wales. So once we'd used the name for the pandemic food and the towels and everything for um, earlier this year, we thought, yeah, let's move to that one because it, it really describes what we want to do. Um, of course, Love Your Neighbour is the second greatest commandment after loving God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And Jesus taught about that in Luke chapter 10. I know you know what it says, but I'm still going to read it because it's always good to listen to it again. So I'm going to open my Bible at that space and just read it. Read out the story of what Jesus did say. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, and how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. 
You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him, he went to him, he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the man who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. So that put him in his place, (laughs) I think. Anyway, I think it's interesting to think about the fact we call him the Good Samaritan, but another name that he could be called was the Good Neighbour. So what did Jesus commend him for? Well, he saw a need which others, with perhaps more reason to care, ignored. He had compassion. He acted on that compassion by showing mercy, using his time and money and energy to serve the one in need, and he followed up. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. So he says that to us as well. That's great. I love the Good Samaritan. Such a great, uh, helpful illustration of what it looks like hmm. to love our neighbour. And so thanks, thanks for the update. That's exciting, new name, and a great passage to kind of really show us what it looks like. Can you help, help us now think, hear about what that will look like for Mac yes. and, and the Love Your Neighbour team, how we're going to be able to live that out? Yes, and I also think it's good because it's got so much authority. It's not like Jesus said, well, love your neighbour if you want to, if you've got time, you know, if you've got a few minutes here or there. It's the second greatest commandment, so it's something that we all need to take, take to heart and work out how we can go and do likewise. And the team offers lots of opportunities to go and do likewise. Um, and they're available right now. So we've got a brochure to give out tonight here. If you're interested, it's got all the ministries on it of what we do and all of those things, but there's also other ways to find those out. We have um, a Love Your Neighbour page on the Menai um, Anglican Church website. We also have a notice board up the back there that tells you all that information. So that just be, yeah, next to the kitchen. So we can do, look at all of those things if you're interested to find out how you can help to serve. Um, so there's a lot of things that we um, can do. There's a lot of things that we are, we are doing. There's always opportunity for new members, for new ministries. If you're interested, come and speak to me. Uh, because I think um, with care and prayer, we hopefully may have the opportunity to share. You never know when you're going to get that second conversation. Um, we did, um, you probably saw the photo of us cleaning up Australia. That was just an... <laughs> An example of that. We're up at Menai High School. It was not a Clean Up Australia Day. We just decided to do it because there was a mess there. And we were standing there with all bags of rubbish and a car stopped. And who should get out but the Mayor of Sutherland Shire. (laughs) And he came and he saw these young people and older people like me who were there. And he wanted to know what was happening. So we told him and he was very impressed. And he said, I love to see young people in the Shire doing these things. I'd like to have further contact. So, of course, we sent Sarah up to be the further contact. (laughs) So that is, um, yeah, that's what we're doing and we'd love to, everyone to be involved. Come and speak to me if you're interested and we can, um, we can just hook you up to whatever we're doing and what you're interested in. Find a place for you. Thanks, Punch. Thanks, Carolyn. It's so, I'm really excited about this ministry and the opportunities we have. It's definitely worth checking out, grabbing a brochure or checking out the board up the back or the website. What, what the team's done is they've listed all the different things, which a lot of them we saw up on the screen there, some of the different events and activities and things that go on through the year. But there's also the contact person uh, that's listed at the website and in the brochure. And uh, whether you want to help that ministry keep 
at running or move forward or even if you need to call on that person, like say you're chatting with a neighbour, literally, uh, who's up the street and they're doing it tough and you think, these guys could really use a meal. You can call the frozen meals coordinator, go pick one up, deliver it and have that opportunity to show some love in a real practical, simple way. And so that's just a really simple example. As I said, it's in the brochure, these different things we're doing on the, on the, on the board up the back and on our website. So it's great. I'm going to pray for us and also this ministry. So let's pray. Uh, Father, we, we think of this command uh, that Jesus reminded us of, that, it, that we are to love you and to love our neighbour, the two greatest commandments. And we want a church to be a church that lives that out. Father, we pray that we would be people who would love you with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, and also love our neighbours as ourselves. We thank you for the Love Your Neighbour team and the many activities and, and programs and events and things that have happened in the past and will keep happening into the future. We pray that you would bless the team and the coordinators of the different uh, ministries and we pray that they would help us uh, have a practical way to live out this command and we pray that as a church uh, whether it's through the work of the Love Your Neighbour team or just as we are interacting with people in our lives we will be people who are known for loving those around us loving the people you put in our lives uh, loving our neighbours locally but also even globally Lord and we want to pray um, that you would help us as we do that uh, to remember this opportunity to show your love ultimately. That we love because you first loved us and we, we want to ask that you'd help those opportunities to point people to your love for them that they might know and experience and find that love for themselves too. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Carolyn. I'm going to invite Chloe and she's going to lead us in, in prayer. Hello everyone, um, I'm Chloe, I have the joy of leading us in prayer today, so if you'd like to join me in talking to our Father, please bow your head. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight repentant of our wrongdoings and the ways we turn away from you. We pray that your Spirit will convict us to pursue a life which brings honour to your name. May we be reminded of the ways you work for the good of those you love, and may our hearts be softened to receive your word delivered by Stephen tonight. Lord, guide his words and give him boldness as he faithfully declares your love. Lord, we pray for the numerous stresses of our world currently. We pray for the US and the ongoing stress of, on their health system as they now face the spread of a new illness. May you be keeping people safe and providing them with wisdom as they make decisions regarding health and day-to-day -day life. Lord, we also pray over increasing tensions between China and the US. May your hand be over the hearts and minds of those making decisions, and may these leaders strive to serve their nation, its people, and your world well. We pray for governments who, sh we continue to pray for governments who strive to act according to your will, and pray that hearts of those in these positions will continue to be shaped by your word. Lord, as we see you work locally, we thank you for the increasing Christian presence in local schools. We pray that SRE within our local primary and high schools will continue to allow for our volunteers to teach of the love that you have for your children and that these children will be inquisitive in knowing more about Jesus for themselves. We thank you for providing our own Menai youth with hearts which look to serve and honour you, including in conversations at school. And we ask that your spirit will equip, equip them for difficult conversations when they arise. Lord, we thank you for the enduring Daisy Hill ministry and pray that people will continue to offer their time to jo joyfully serve the elder women of our community. Lord, we pray that fellowship between the women will be strong, united under your name, and that it will remain a joyous time for all. Lord, finally, we pray for the spread of your word in Cloncurry. May your spirit sustain Simon and Angela's work as they continue to build relationships there. 
And may we as a church be giving with how we offer up partnerships and provide financially and prayerfully for them. We pray for this night and all of our discussions in your name. Amen. Tonight we're continuing on our One Thessalonians series, so Cam is going to come read the Bible. G'day, my name is Cam. Um, yeah, we're going to be continuing in the um, One Thessalonians series, as um, as Sarah just said. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, if you'd like to open your Bibles to um, the first verse, is actually um, uh, John fifteen verses nine through seventeen. Um, yeah, I'll just give you a bit of time. All right, John 15, verse, starting at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so, you, so, um, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remained in his love. I have told you this so that you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. If you are my friends, uh, you are my friends if I do if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that, uh, so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that Whatever you ask in my, in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. And the second passage, um, which is from 1 Thessalonians, um, it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're starting at verse 17, and we'll be reading through to um, chapter 3, verse um, 13. Right. Okay. But brothers and sisters, when we were uh, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you certainly. I Paul did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Um, so, when we, so when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens, we sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service, in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one, could, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, we, uh, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted and it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was, the, I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our laborers, um, uh, that our labors might be in vain. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in our distress and persecution, 
we were encouraged about you because of, of your faith. For, we, for now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may the God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as our dear, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Thanks, Cam. Hi, everybody. Great to see you tonight. Uh, good to hear of, um, well, a rebranding, um, but our emphasis on loving our neighbour. That will come up as we um, look at this passage um, um, tonight. But um, uh, we do want to be taking every opportunity to love those in and around our community and further afield. And we do that in many ways. And I want to encourage you to go see Carolyn and Eric later on tonight and find out more about how you can be involved. Let me pray for us as we, um, as we start tonight. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word and we pray now as we come to this letter to the Thessalonians that it will be um, an encouragement to us, a model to us um, of what it is to live out our faith as we wait for Jesus' return. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, next weekend is the famous uh, Sun Herald City to Surf. A couple of people here I know are going to be running in it and so um, uh, you need to be a pretty keen runner though. Every August, more than 50,000 runners turn up in Sydney for Australia's premier um, road race. Every year, the City to Surf makes the news highlights. The image of a sea of people waiting for the starting gun is just a great spectacle. Uh, so many people that at the last people cross the start line, the front runners have already made half the distance. Now, of course, you always see um, pictures of those dressed up as gorillas or superheroes, and I'm pretty sure that few of them get much past the, um, the start line, because this is a tough race. You start in the city and you run along William Street, past Rushcutters Bay, Rose Bay, and it's all pretty scenic. And, um, and it's not too bad at the beginning. But at the 6K mark, uh, when you're not quite halfway, you start to feel the pain. And then, well, I'm told you do, I haven't done it. And then you hit the hardest part of the course, the well-known Heartbreak Hill. A hill that goes for two kilometres. Heartbreak Hill has a gradient of one in 8.5. That is, for every eight and a half metres forward, you go up one metre. So every 500 metres, you're climbing 60 metres into the air. This is actually a tough hill. Heartbreak Hill is the place where you'll come unstuck if you haven't been doing the training. Heartbreak Hill can bring down even the best of runners. Even with superpowers, you'll struggle to get past Heartbreak Hill. At the 8K mark, it starts to flatten out a bit, and then the course swings around south, um, and you come along the coastline down to Bondi Beach to finish. Best ever time, 40 minutes and 3 seconds by Steve Monaghetti back in 1991. Almost matched by Harry, um, Harry Summers, last time it was officially run in 2019, who missed the record by two seconds. <laughs> but most people finish somewhere between an hour and a half to three hours. 40 minutes, amazing that these guys can do it. Simon, I can see you're there. Are you jumping in next week? Yeah. Cam? who just read the Bible, he's jumping in next week. Good luck, guys. <laughs> now, being a Christian can be a lot like that run. If you've been a Christian for a while, you'll know that that's true. It's not an easy run. And sooner or later, you're going to hit Heartbreak Hill. 
you're going to hit a tough time where it's hard to keep going. Here in this section of 1 Thessalonians from chapter 2 verse 17 to the end of chapter 3, Paul's writing to encourage the Thessalonians uh, because he knows that it's been tough going for them. And he wants them to keep going as they face their own heartbreak hill. He wants them to finish the race strongly. If you remember from the last couple of weeks, we've heard that this little church has started strong. The Thessalonians have been running. And for this reason, Paul says, we always thank God for you. You're a model church. You're strong in faith. You're strong in love and enduring in hope. Because of the way you are living, the Lord's message has rung out to the whole world because of you. But the question is, will they remain strong to the end? Will they continue the same way as they started? And that's what Paul's been worried about. He knows they started strong, but will they finish strong? Or will they come crashing down in a heap when they hit Heartbreak Hill? Because he knows that this is not an easy race. He knows the Christian life is a difficult course, and he knows that along the way they're going to face temptations and trials and opposition. It's going to get harder before it gets easier. They will be tempted to give up. And we see in chapter 3, verse 5, that he's worried about their faith. He himself was torn away from them just three weeks after originally bringing the gospel to them. Three weak old Christians, and he's, um, the leader has been taken away from them. And he, gets, um, and he wants to come back and see them again. He wants to keep adding to the things that he taught them, uh, but Satan keeps stopping him. So he sends Timothy to check up on how things are going. Have a look, chapter 3, verse 5. He says, For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and our labours might have been in vain. You see, Paul knows that this is a tough battle. This is a really big hill for them to get over. The Thessalonians are facing strong opposition. And even though Paul's with them uh, in thought, he says in 2.17 he can't be there in person. And he wishes he was. He's not there to help to defend the gospel and keep the faith. And he just wishes he was there. Because he knows they're fa facing strong opponents. We saw back in chapter 2, verse 14, that they were facing persecution from their own countrymen, just like the Jewish Christians were from the Jews. You know, it's funny, isn't it? But how almost ev everyone seems to have something against Christians. I think that's why stand-up comedians love having a go at Christians. Uh, it's an easy win, an easy laugh. Christian bashing is easy. The media love it. At times it seems to be more popular to be a criminal than it does to be a Christian. The Thessalonians are copying it from the guy who lives next door. In Acts chapter 17 we read the account how Jason and some of the brothers are hauled out before the courts for the sake of the name of Jesus. And who knows what else they have to endure. And Paul says in chapter 3 verse 3, You knew the trials were coming. Remember I kept telling you that they were coming. Picking up halfway through verse 3. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. This should be no surprise. It's all part of the course. But that's not all. That's just the start of the hill. That's just at the 6K mark. There's also temptations from Satan. Paul says, I kept trying to come back to you, but Satan kept stopping me. Chapter 2, verse 18. For he wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. No wonder Paul's worried. No wonder he sent Timothy to see how they're going. They're up against strong opposition. Their countrymen are up in arms against them. The Jews don't want a bar of them. Satan is attacking, using whatever external pressure he can to try and get them to give up, using all kinds of persecution to make it difficult so that they will just find it too hard and walk away. And he's applying pressure also from the inside, tempting them, whispering them to them, give up. It's just a lie. It's too hard. And Paul, let's face it, where's Paul when you need him? If he did care about you, he'd be here. Just give up. 
just give up. In fact, chapter 2, verse 3, we see Timothy hasn't been just sent to see how they're going, but Paul sends him to strengthen and encourage them. He assumes that they're going to be in a pretty bad state. Verse 2, we sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. We sent Timothy to remind you again of the message of the gospel, to tell you about how much we care about you, to remind you that Jesus is Lord, to encourage you. So Paul's anxious as he waits to hear back from Timothy. Will they be running strong? Or has Heartbreak Hill gained another victim? And you can imagine it, can't you? Timothy comes back. And Paul, he's so desperate to hear how they're going. And so he says to Timothy, come on, come on, just give it to me straight. Just tell me, how are they going? And Timothy says, well, no, 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 I, I can't, I can't. I don't want to know that they've, got, uh, that they've uh, fallen over. No, 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 tell me, tell me, I've got to know. I've got to know, how are they going? And Timothy says, it's okay, Paul, it's okay. They're doing great. They're doing really well. They're stronger than ever. Talk about faith, they haven't budged an inch. Even after temptation and suffering and persecution, they're still strong in the faith. They're still living with Jesus as their Lord. They're still strong in their love, caring for one another and caring for those around them. They're working hard at it. And they miss you, Paul, just as much as you miss them. They speak as though you were like their father. And they send their love. It's all good, Paul. It's all good. Well, you can see how Paul responds from verse 6 onwards. I reckon Paul just sits down at that very moment and he writes this letter to the Thessalonians. But from verse 6, But Timothy has just come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you will always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we are encouraged about you because of your faith. Now we really live, since you are standing firm in the Lord. This is how it should be, shouldn't it? The Thessalonians are powering up Outbreak Hill, getting stronger in faith, deeper in love. Love for each other, love for others in and around them. And they're looking forward to the day when Jesus comes back. And Paul couldn't be happier. Now we really live since we're standing firm in the Lord. It doesn't get any better for Paul. This is living. And we get a glimpse of why this means so much to Paul at the end of chapter 2, verse 19. Because he says, what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we are glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. You see, there's no glory along the way for Paul. He himself is in all sorts of persecution down in Athens and struggling, probably imprisoned. Now, what's his glory? What's his joy? It's when he sees those that Jesus has called to him running strongly and standing firm. To see those that he shared the gospel with powering on in their Christian lives. And the crown will come in seeing them stand firm until the end. So that when Jesus comes, they are standing with him at that very time. That's his crown. That's his joy. And he wants to encourage them to make it to the end. So as he hears the great news about the Thessalonians, he sits down and he writes, and he thanks God in verse 9, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? And he says, I want to see you soon. I want to strengthen you even more in the faith when I see you. And so look what he prays. Verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in his presence. Oh, so in the presence of our God and Father, when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Throughout this letter, Paul's just got Jesus' return on the brain. 
He is so certain of Jesus' return that it, it, it actually impacts everything he says and writes. He wants them to be ready for this day. May God strengthen you in faith. May your love increase so much that it overflows, not only for one another, but for everyone. Until you get to the finish line. Paul says that this is his hope. This is his joy and the crown that he will receive when the Lord Jesus returns. That they finish strongly. It's a little, it's a pretty good little section, isn't it? Very encouraging. You're like, it could have gone all bad, but it didn't. It's actually been awesome. An awesome little section of scripture. But what does it say to us? How does this letter from Paul written so long ago impact you and me? Well, for a start, we see a wonderful model of leadership here, don't we? Paul is passionately concerned for the progress of these Christian friends. He's lying awake at night wondering how they're going. I wonder if you're a Christian leader here tonight, if you do that. Perhaps you're a kids leader. Perhaps you're a youth leader, a scripture teacher, maybe part of the Daisy Hill ministry team or one of the other teams, one of the Love Your Neighbours team, whatever it might be. But particularly those children's ministries and youth ministries. I mean, I want to say thank you for turning up every week and for teaching and for, and for, um, and for going through the lesson of that week. But is that where it stops for you? Do you actually, in your heart of hearts, long for those that you're ministering to, to be growing? Do you long for them to make it to the end? Are you hoping that they're going to be with you on that last day and that you're going to do anything you can to make sure that they move with you to get to that point? And what about when they hit Heartbreak Hill? When they're starting to doubt or starting to not turn up or whatever it might be, what does that do in you? Because in some senses, God's put you there as their coach at that foundational stage in their lives. Now, you're not there alone. One of the things I find the most encouragement about this passage is, and I'm sure Paul is encouraged by this as well, is just how unbelievably well the Thessalonians are going, even though Paul himself couldn't be there with them. Indeed, we told in this letter that he was only there for three weeks at the start of their Christian lives and then was ripped away from them. But what is clear in this letter is he still loved them. He devoted himself in prayer for them, knowing that God could keep them even though he just didn't know how that would turn out. He prayed for them. He prayed longingly for them, that they would keep growing when he was absent from them. He himself wasn't there with them, but he was partnering with God, a co-worker with God, in leading them. And as a leader, we're co-workers with God in bringing growth to those that we lead. But it goes for the other leaders in our church too, doesn't it? What about a growth group leader? How well do we really know those who are in our growth group? Their temptation, their struggles. Are your thoughts with them, even when you're not with them? Are you praying for them through the week? Not just the leaders for their group members, but the group members for one another. Are we praying for one another? Are we getting alongside of each other, particularly in those times when we hit the hill and we're struggling with one thing or another in our Christian lives or in our life in general? Are we walking alongside of each other, encouraging each other? As a leader, have you got them in your mind through the week? Have you got the, um, are you taking the opportunities when they come up to encourage and to mentor and to help them um, engage in the mission together? Engage in, um, in prayer together. Paul's a great model of leadership here for us because he gets his model from the Lord Jesus himself. But it's not just a good model of leadership that we get from this passage. This passage gives us a picture of a church that's going from strength to strength in difficult circumstances. In many ways, they are a model church. 
And Paul was overjoyed to hear about their faith in Jesus and their overflowing love in his absence. And it's important to see that this love wasn't just for one another, but for everyone. That's why the launch of Love Your Neighbour uh, is so important today. Because our love needs to start with our brothers and sisters in Christ. But that love that's so filled us needs to overflow to loving for the people that God has placed in our lives as well, outside of the family of God. Taking opportunities to reach out with love, to show Jesus' love to those who don't yet know his love. I loved what Carolyn said. Um, With care and prayer, we may get the opportunity to share. With care and prayer, we may get the opportunity to share. That was an awesome way of helping to understand how we connect with the community around us. Yes, we do want the opportunity to share the wonderful news of Jesus, but it comes on the back of being there present and in their lives, hospitable to those around us, looking for opportunities of loving and caring for those, many of which don't have a voice, many of which um, uh, find it hard um, to survive in this world, and we take the opportunities to care in prayer, and we may get the opportunity to share. But there is an opportunity to love, not only one another, but everyone. I love our church. It's so encouraging to keep meeting new people um, that I've never met before. I've been here now um, for six and a half years, and almost every week I meet somebody new. What an awesome church to be seeing new people coming in so regularly. And to hear the stories, one after the other, of people caring for those in difficult circumstances, in the way that we love for one another. I love it. I love hearing how we care for each other and look out for each other. And how we dig deep to love the community that God's placed us in. And we've got all these opportunities. This um, pamphlet's got, I think, something like 12 or 15 different areas of which gives us opportunities to love those in our community. It's amazing the different ways that we as a church um, are trying to take the step to love others, um, particularly in a time of crisis. Be encouraged. Menai Anglican really does seem to be a church where lives are being changed, where generations have been impacted, and where Jesus is at the centre of all that we do. And so can I encourage you to hear Paul's words tonight, to keep going in this to the very end. Make sure each other's here. Look around you. That person next to you, make sure they're there to the end. Encourage each other. Walk with each other. Pray for each other that none will be lost, and that we'll be there together on the day that Jesus returns, growing in love for one another and for everyone, and enduring in hope, even when it gets hard, knowing that Jesus will return and will make all things new. Let me pray that that will be the case for us here at Menai. Our Father, we do thank you so much for this very encouraging passage, a passage that shows us the incredible heart of the Apostle Paul, the way that he cared and loved for this new little church, this fleeting church, the church that he didn't even know if they had the roots that actually held them together for the gospel. And yet it did, because you were part of their lives and you were bringing that growth even in his absence. And so when he gets that report, he's so excited to hear how they're growing in their faith and how they're growing in their love, not only for each other, but for those around them. And Father, we pray that we would be like this church, because not only is it a model leader, but it's also a model church for us, a church that we want to be like, a church that's loving um, one another through the ups and downs, um, keeping each other to the end, but also a church that's loving others in our community. Father, please help us to be that church that sees lives change, generations impacted, and Jesus at the center of everything that we do. And please help us to hang in there, endure with hope, because we know that Jesus is returning and he will make all things new. Help us to hang in there to the end. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
So my name is Andrew, um, Senior Minister at Church. It's my privilege now to lead us in a, a, a symbolic meal, uh, an opportunity for us. We do this once a month. We have a symbolic meal, uh, a little bit of uh, bread, a little bit of grape juice um, to point us back to what Jesus did on the cross, to lift our eyes to what God is doing for us now and to look forward to his return. If you didn't get uh, one of those little packs and if you're a, a Christian person who knows and loves the Lord, put your hand up and, and someone will give one to you. If you're just visiting with us, particularly if, um, and if you know the Lord, you're welcome to join us as well. Um, if, if that's not you at the moment, uh, just see what we do um, and watch what we, what we do. Uh, Jesus is a model leader because he not only loved us back then, but he had it on his heart and still on his heart that we keep going strong for him. And one of the verses that uh, the prayer that we just, uh, Stephen just uh, opened for us is in 1 Thessalonians 3.13, May the Lord Jesus strengthen your hearts so you be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when he comes with his holy ones. And uh, one of the ways that God strengthens us for the race, in the hard times and the good, is, is to teach us that we don't live by bread alone, but we live on the Word of God, and we live on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to eat this bread, reminding that our life is dependent on the body of Jesus. We're going to drink a bit of grape juice, remembering that all that we do, proclaiming to our souls that all that we do is dependent on Jesus Christ. Let me just read a few verses from Scripture. God's word says, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So just take a moment to prepare, uh, to take, you've got to open up these little layers, a little bit tricky. Um, open up the first clear one to get the bread, open up the, the silver one to get the grape juice. So just give you a moment to get those ready and we'll eat and drink together. So brothers and sisters on this race, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross for your sake. Take and eat this remembrance that Christ's body was broken for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with great thanksgiving. And let's remember that the blood of Jesus was spilled for us. Drink this remembrance of the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and for all the sins of the future and for people, anyone throughout this world who calls in his name. Drink this and be thankful. Let's pray. Father God, you've strengthened us through the preaching of the word, through prayer, through the encouragement of our brothers and sisters. And as we've eaten and drinking, dr dr drunk this bread and this wine, that you've strengthened us in our inner being to teach and to proclaim to us that we're dependent on you. Father, may we be strengthened this week. May we be strengthened this day for your service to walk in all the good works you prepared for us, Lord. May we be strengthened to endure, to keep going, to keep loving as we should, to keep hoping and to keep walking by faith. Father, thank you so much for the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. We're going to continue to strengthen our faith by singing together and by praising God. So why don't we stand and sing. And in this song, there's an opportunity a little, uh, for dropping those in a little box coming around. Thanks.
Thank you so much to the band, and thank you to Stefan for bringing us God's Word tonight. Um, it's actually so helpful that your analogy is going to remind us next weekend, um, what we talked about tonight, to be encouraged to pray for each other, to um, support and encourage one another. I'm just going to read the verse. I know Andrew read it again, but I just really love the prayer um, that he has, and it's something that we can be praying for each other as well. Um, verse 13 of chapter 3. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. What a beautiful verse and what a beautiful encouragement for us. Um, just a couple of reminders. The women's event is coming up and you can actually register tonight at the information hub. So if you're keen on coming, come and see me uh, and we can get that going. Also, go and see Carolyn and Eric if you want to sign up for the Love Your Neighbor team or work on any of the projects that they have going on. And finally, if you're new or visiting and you want to connect with us or know more about us, we have a little connect card which has a little QR code. So if you're interested in that too, there's like an info hub at the back. So come and see me um, for that. I am going to pray for us in to close before we have supper if you want to join me. Father God, I thank you so much for tonight and for the time that we could spend uh, in your word and um, being encouraged by Paul and Timothy and the church in Thessalonica. And God, we pray that you will help us to be mutually encouraging and edifying each other so that we can see um, all of us before Jesus uh, when he returns. Lord, please give us um, comfort and hope in uncertain times and please help us to persevere uh, we need your help and we need um, the Holy Spirit. And so I just pray uh, that amongst our church and all its members. We thank you for tonight and pray uh, for the rest of our time together, Lord. May it be um, helpful and honoring to you. Amen. We're going to have some supper, so stick around. They'll be bringing some food. See you all next week. <laughs>